to a group of people that have sold out to go all the way. We'll be talking to a group of people whom God has enlightened by the Holy Ghost to see around where all of this old fiddlestick mess that just piles up around you is going to disappear out of your life. And you're going to have a reality that you can sink yourself into that is unchanging. And I want you to know that the Bible says that the priesthood we're of in this hour is an unchanging priesthood. And if we're part of an unchangeable priesthood, we should be able to touch a realm of perfection in God and not come back down out of it. But function all the time in that divine order of God's perfection. Hallelujah. Now I'm not talking about a realm of needs. And I'm not talking about a realm where you've always got to have something. But I'm talking about a place in God this morning where all your needs are supplied according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. A place where you're not fighting anything but you're resting in the fullness of God. And a place where your prayer life has become the biggest joy of your world because you know that every word that proceeds out of your mouth is a divine message of the Holy Ghost coming through you. And I tell you from this, these recent of days, the Lord was talking to me so strongly this morning that from this recent of days on, uh, we will be speaking and addressing two groups of people. There will be those who go in and out, in and out, They'll come in and touch it, but it won't change. And they'll go back out and experience the same dilemmas. But there is a group of folks 
that are going in and they ain't coming out. Hallelujah. I'm talking about in the spirit this morning. They're going in and they're not coming out. They're going to experience what it is to stand on the resurrection ground. Hallelujah. And all death will be under their feet. All sickness will be under their feet. All dilemmas, all distresses, all doubt, everything. And things you struggle with all your life, the struggle will be over. And you will have your feet on top of Zion. You'll set your feet on Zion and you'll rule and reign there. And this has got to be. It's got to be. Because there's mighty, mighty changes got to come forth around here. And in order for them to happen, God has got to have a people who will quit going in and out. But a people who will stay lifted up in the glory. Hallelujah. I won't have to pray you through every Sunday and I won't have to preach you up every Wednesday. But every time I see you, you will be on fire with the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to remind you that God will only speak through a burning bush. He won't speak through a smoking bush, but a burning bush. And it's the hour when we must burn, hallelujah, with the glory of the Lord in order for the Lord to speak through us. Hallelujah. Let's worship Him this morning. Everybody praise Him. Thank you, my Father. Oh, hallelujah. And counsel, he's wonderful. about the life of God. And I'm going to be reading this morning from the Mirror Bible. I'm going to be reading verses 5 through 11. And in verse 5 it says, Now in the light of what we are gifted with in Christ, the stage is set to display life's excellence. Explore the adventure of faith. Imagine the extreme dedication and focus of a conductor of music. How he would diligently acquaint himself with every individual voice in the choir, as well as the contribution of every specific instrument, to follow the precise sound 
represented in every single note in order to give maximum credit to the original composition. This is exactly what it means to exhibit the divine character. You are the choir conductor of your own life. Study the full content of faith. Discover in faith how elevated you are, and from within this position of your co-seatedness in Christ, new understanding will dawn within you. You see, that's what's happened since we've walked into this kingdom, as it says in the Psalms, that deep calls after deep. That we are revealed as we see us as life in Christ, that we are revealed more into the life of Him, that He shows us deeper our identity and our purpose in the Lord. And that is where, even in Genesis, when He breathed into man and He created the glorified being, that it was in the image of himself, that we see in his face, us. I heard, we were listening to different preachers this morning, and I think I heard about every single one of them say that no longer that they see us, but they see Christ. And that's what it is about us, about the life of God, that it's a joy that's overflowing, that this image is so much represented that when they see us, they see Christ, a representation of heaven. And through that is in worship. When we see the image of Christ, the perfect image of him is through love and through worship. We have um, a program with the school that we have and it's where it's called precious, not prickly. And we teach kids to be a por not a porcupine, but a hedgehog, because a porcupine impales the person, but a hedgehog is gentle. And with that, every day that the children come in, they have to tell us what they're thankful for, because they've done a brain study that in the same spot in the brain where you're thankful for is also where you experience stress and that they cannot exist together. And that's part of the life of God, is when you thank the Lord for all that He has done, there is no stress, no harm, no fear, no worry that can exist there, it cannot coexist. That's what has come out of the tradition of man. Because when you were on the religious tradition and the false doctrine that was there, it was oftentimes, it was a stressful thing to be perfect. When it was holy, they thought you had to look a certain way, that you had to dress a certain way, that you could only do good things. And if you did one thing that was a mess up, that you were no longer perfect in God. But we know that through His grace and through His mercy seat, that He's made us blameless. That there is no failure or setbacks in God. That He just leads us on more into the image of His grace. Yeah. Hallelujah. And let's look in verse 6. And it says, Here you will realize your inner strength and how fully competent you are to prevail in patient perseverance in the midst of any contradiction. It is from within this place of understanding that worship is born. In worship, you will find a genuine fondness of others at the heart of everything that faith unfolds in the agape love of God. And then it goes on, explains that worship and devotion includes esteeming people and honoring friendship. The same voice that magnifies God cannot insult a person made in God's image. The worship is to touch someone's life with the same devotion and care you would touch Jesus himself. Even if the other person seems a most unlikely candidate. The word agape is from ago, meaning to lead as a shepherd leads his sheep and peo to rest. As in Psalm 23, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul or by the waters of reflection, my soul remembers who I am. And you see there, that's what it is when you're walking in the love of God. No matter 
who it is, no matter what they say or do to you, that it's the love of God. I was listening to Michelle O'Donnell last night, and she was talking about the realms of darkness, that people think that they see darkness, and really all it is is a false image, a veil that's a facade, and that really if you always, whenever you look at someone, and you look at the inner person that's there, that you can no longer see darkness because within their soul there's not darkness, but there's only the light of God that just needs to be unveiled. Because that's all that darkness is, yeah. is the absence of light. That's, light. that's all it is. And you see, He's the light of the world and He's made you the light of the world because you are Christ. It says if you're in Christ, then you are Christ. And she said that all it is with darkness is that you have to, if you look at it, at the darkness, you're just seeing a false image there. You're just seeing an imagination. Right. That when you see darkness, that the only way to not see it is to show the love of God. Because when you show the love of God, worship and thankfulness and the life of God floods the atmosphere. And you see that life is felt in the original identity in God. And in his worship. And we cannot find out who we really are if we look at all the mundane circumstances. If you are looking at the natural, you are not seeing the life of God. If you're looking at what your health looks like, you're not seeing the life of God. You have to see that there is more beyond just this simple presence, this mundane, I'm going in a routine, one or the other. And that's why over and over there's a word that there's a change. There's going to be an explosion that we're going to see of people that are no longer just wanting the simple, walking in a religious way, that they only see the church as the building. But that instead that we are the church and that they see the body and that in unity the life comes together. And in verse 8, it says, While you diligently rehearse the exact qualities of every divine attribute within you, the volume will rise with ever-increasing gusto, guarding you from being ineffective and barren in your knowledge of the Christ life, displayed with such authority and eloquence in Jesus. If anyone fills that these things are absent in his life, they are not. Spiritual blindness and short-sightedness only veil them from you. This happens when one loses one sight of one innocence. The moment one forgets the tremendous consequence of the fact that we were cleansed from our past sins, one seems to become preoccupied again with the immediate sense-ruled horizon which is what short-sightedness is all about. This makes one blind to his blessings. Spiritual realities suddenly seem vague in distance, and being acquainted, become acquainted with your innocence. You see, that's where the mercy seat is. It's made a blind. It made everything that's there. It's blameless that it causes other people to be blind to the fact. I remember Brother Chris, he kept talking about when he started his business because of things in his past, that at first he was concerned, he was worried that it was going to show up. But then he realized, no, 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 there's a mercy seat there. If you make us blameless, and that he decreed, and he declared, and he spoke it forth of what it was going to be. And that when they were there that naturally it should not have been able for him to become a business owner. But when they looked, it was met blameless. When they bought their house, everything was cleared and was made blameless. The same with his son Scrappy, that when he was there and he was before the court and the judge, he had 15 counts against him. But because we spoke and declared it, he was made blameless. Yes. And that's what it is under the mercy seat yes. for me. Like this. Yes. There's so many times.
promise that people expect you to fail over and again. I have so many friends, and I have even some people that when they knew who I was from high school, they still see the blame there. They still think that we're a repeating cycle, but we're not. We're not one that has that mentality that it has to go over and over again. See, that's a part of that old religious mindset that if your grandfather was a drunk and your daddy was a drunk, then you have to be a drunk. And that if your grandmother, if she was had her hair up in rollers and pins and wore no makeup and had a dress down to the floor and walked with her head as a lower person than her husband, then it had to repeat the same cycle. But that's not what it was. There was a misrepresentation there. And that's what it's talking about in this word is that you've been made innocent. Everything. The slate has been wiped clean. It's like you're like a computer. And you see sometimes computers, they get viruses or the hard drive crashes. But when you send that computer, they wipe everything clean. Because that's the way that it is restored to its original identity. Sometimes, most of the time, if they try to fix it and leave what was there, then another problem occurs. But that's what the Lord does. He wipes your hard drive clean to where you're set back into your original identity. You see, that was the whole purpose of Christ. That when he came and he gave his life and he did away with all of the natural sacrifices of the priest, he made you back into the original identity where you would return back into the Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden means God's delight. And you see when he looks at you, you are his delight. Because you've made innocent. He wipes them clean. I used to sing a worship song that when I first came across, and it used to say uh, that your sins were forgotten and they've been put on the ocean floor. Well, the ocean is deep and you can't see them anymore. There's people, they try to reach the bottom of the ocean floor to the deepest depths and they've never been able to do that because it's so deep and it's so dark and the pressure is so deep. But you see, that's what happens. The Lord completely erases the memory that no matter what the circumstances is, no matter who has been put in your life and then removed because of circumstance that the Lord wipes it clean. There is no friendship that you need if it's going to bring you down and keep you veiled where you're not made innocent in the Lord. And then in verse 10 it says, Therefore I would encourage you, my fellow family, to make every immediate effort to become cemented in the knowledge of our original identity, revealed and confirmed in the logic of God. Fully engage these realities in your lifestyle, and so you will never fail. Your original identity, often translated as calling, to surname, to identify by name. You see, when he calls you back into himself, he calls you by his name, and his name is Jesus. Some people, they have a hard concept with that. If you talk to a normal person that just goes to a Trinity church, that's just a normal church goer that really hasn't sought the deep things of God, and you tell them that you're Jesus or that you're God, they think that you're speaking blasphemy. But you're speaking what the Lord has caused you to be because you are Jesus. You are Christ. You have been set to be a part. I think of the story that Pastor Matt shared about Brother Hall, that those pastors had invited him. And he was talking about, do they still think that Jesus has miracles? Does he still believe that Jesus raised up for the dead? And he said no. And they started to sign him up. And then he goes, but I do believe that I can raise them from the dead. And I do believe that I can still heal people and do miracles. But see, that's what it is. That through your hands and through your belief and through your spoken word that you do change the atmosphere. I saw a thing that there was a, a friend of mine that became an atheist. They started believing in science. And they put 
a picture up on our Facebook wall and it said science because God doesn't heal amputees. But you see, that's false information. That evidently, it's sad. I just, I just believe for his mind to come back to the original identity of what it is. Because it had to be that someone had to instill that thought in his mind. That he had to feed on it. Because the thing is, that there have been miracles after miracles where the Lord has healed amputees. And he did not rely on science. There's so many miracles over and over that we read of John G. Lake and Mary Woods, Maria Woods with Edder and all of these other people of the faith. But the thing is that they're still happening today. There's still people that are having their limbs grown out that are being healed of things. When we read of monkeys and dragons, there's a couple there that she was diagnosed with cancer that was supposedly terminal. And no one ever recovered with it. But that couple decided that they would not speak of it. So they decided they didn't have a whole lot of money at the time because all they spent on their medical stuff. But there was somebody that had a cottage. So they decided that they would go out there and they wouldn't talk of all that was going on. But instead, they would just talk about how much they loved each other and how much they were enjoying the nature and they would get out. And at first, she couldn't get out of bed, but they could open the window and they could listen to the birds sing and they could see all the flowers growing. And then they started realizing that she was getting healthier and getting stronger. So they took her, so then she started to go outside and sit by the river. How much of a representation, because there's life in the river of God. He was just allowing his nature and his beauty and his identity to over-encompass them. And then as she became strong, she started cooking and doing her normal things. And they eventually left the cottage and went back to the doctor. And all he had to do was confirm that it was an act of God, that there was no explanation for it. I heard another story this morning on Bill Winston where this lady, uh, she had something wrong with her kidneys and the numbers were down. And they said, well, don't expect anyone that ever has this, their numbers just keep going down until they eventually die. And she decided her family wanted to go on a trip to Disney. And they told her, we don't want you walking around Disney, you're too weak to be doing that. And she just said, she lists them kind of like my grandmother used to do, ah, oh, whatever. And she went on to Disney and she walked around and she said sometimes she felt weak. But you know what? She kept saying no. Said no to the situation. And she kept pushing herself and going on and she had a good time. And then the next time she went back to the doctor and said, I don't know what happened. But your numbers have gone up and they're normal. But you see, that's what happens to us. There was about a year ago, I don't even like to remember it, but I broke my foot. And, you know, normal circumstances that once you become past the age of a child and you're considered an adult, they say that a foot can take up to three to six months to heal, though especially the way that it broke. My doctor said, I've never seen anyone break their foot that way. It's usually here or there. But you broke it here. That's an odd place. And that'll probably take longer to heal, but we'll do this. And then they wanted me to walk on crutches. And then... They gave me this walking boot, and I said, you know, can I walk in the walking boot without the crutches? And he goes, I don't know if you're ready for that, but if you feel you're ready for that, then yeah, you can walk out of here without the crutches. So I just picked up my foot, just expected it to work, and I just walked out with that. And it wasn't but about four weeks. It was completely healed up, and he said, well, it's all healed. You can go back to normal shoe. I'll see you one more time. And they x-rayed, yeah, it's still healed, and everything was there. And you see, that's what happens with it. Is that the Lord, when his life of God, that the miraculous has to take place. That when you worship the Lord, things have to change. Because when you worship him, you go up into higher levels of knowledge and truth in him. That it overcomes everything. That this world doesn't matter. That's why that I firmly believe that every one of us will have divine help. That we're no longer taking part to this flesh that we have to hold on to it. 
It doesn't matter what age you are. I heard this morning that there was a, a lady that at first she was becoming discouraged because she wasn't reaching her goals because she's in her 50s. But then she decided the Lord impressed upon her to look up people who started businesses or creative ideas when they were in their 40s and 50s. And some of them were like the inventor of Walmart and McDonald's and things like that. And then she said, well, if they can do that when they're in their 40s and 50s, then I guess I can still reach my goals. You see, there's still some creative ideas because the purpose yet hasn't been there. Some of us, it takes a little bit more time to polish. Brother Matt and Sister Heather, they know this. They, they have a jewelry business where they go and find antique jewelry. And they tell me stories all the time that when people sell it to them for dirt cheap money, they say, I don't you know, that's not worth anything. There's nothing going to be there. But then they set that polish on it. And as they polish it, just like the Lord polishes us, he polishes our heart. He polishes out all the stains and all the tarnish and all the darkness there as we give it to him in worship and reading his word and become knowledge and embracing him in the spirit and letting the language of God speak through us and become us and become deeper in Christ. And all of a sudden this treasure is revealed and things that they probably bought for five dollars they were able to sell for 200 because that's what you are that you are a treasure you're worth more than you think for so many years even though we were in that knowledge of faith thank goodness for kenneth hagan because my grandfather learned a lot from him about faith and oral roberts but there was still this unworthiness that was taught within us that we shouldn't there even as a child I guess because of that, my teachers would say, Megan, you're so smart, but as we walk, as you we watch you walk, your head is over. I did. When I was little, I used to walk like this, and they were concerned that I was going to have a curvature in my spine because I would always look. But I think it was that mentality that, yeah, I might be smart and stuff, but I shouldn't be worthy of recognition. But you see, the Lord, He puts you co seededness, it says in there. He puts you beside Him on His throne in equality, in His sonship with you, that He causes you to have a worthiness that is no longer I have to crawl on the floor and just say, Can I eat? I'm a dog. Can I eat from the Master's table? But instead, He rises you above like Ruth and sits you beside Him and gives you the best of it. When, those, when she was in the field and those people dropped, they didn't drop the scraggly stuff for her. They dropped handfuls of purpose. And in handfuls of purpose, that's where the best is. They probably reached in there. I have no shadow of doubt. They reached in there. They pulled, oh, this is the fattest part of it. You know, yeah. you know we were at one time, we were at a restaurant and somebody had they had forgot to get somebody a baked potato and then when the waitress bought it out that baked potato was huge and oh it was my aunt and my aunt said my goodness that's the biggest potato i've ever seen she said well we have to make it up to you you see that's what the lord is doing that when you decide to embrace the identity of him and decide to walk in the truth of him and he makes it up to you he just starts prospering you. He just starts causing you to feel better when you wake up. And even when the pain is still there and the symptoms are still there and it still says you have one sin. But you don't have to look at that. That even though you say you have one sin, I am blessed and I am walking in the blessing of the Lord. And the blessing of the Lord goes just beyond finances. It goes in every realm, even in your family. That's why there's changes. That's why there's already people walking in here. That's why some of you are already getting phone calls and connections of people that you lost. That there's things that are there. You know, at first I was saddened when I saw one of my friends got a divorce. But you know what? When she married this man, I knew there was an issue there. There wasn't something quite right because he would get easily angry and things like that. But she actually, he told her that she couldn't be friends with me because I saw the anger within him when we were back in college. And it was a few years ago that she asked to be my friend on Facebook and we reconnected. And ever since we reconnected, there were sometimes nights 
that the Lord would have me pray over her for protection. And you know what? She never had any children. But And she ended up, I saw a couple weeks ago that she got divorced. But you know what? The Lord protected her because her husband, which he can be redeemed as well, decided that he was going to be a transgender woman. And I know that she probably at first probably was down thought the lowest of the low because she'd been married him to five years and he was very emotionally abusive to her. But you know what? That's all I see is that she's made blameless because now she's all the time posting things about how the Lord can bring you through. And that's what I just say, well, Lord, you can erase the memory. It don't matter what it is there. You fight and you can polish her. And that's what it is, is that I heard little Gabriel Last, uh, last time I did children's church, Nellie, she had something going on with her eye. And I was saying, let's believe for her that she has a speedy recovery. And he recovered, He actually corrected my speech, you know, out of the mouth of babes. And he said, Megan, we don't have to believe anything anymore. I said, well, that's right. And he goes, no, no, no. We spoke it. And when we spoke it, that's in the past. And it's already done. She's already healed. And you see... That's what it is, is that even when my friend there, that she's made blameless, that she already is wiped the slate clean, that the Lord's going to send somebody in her life that truly loves her, that she's going to be made clean. She don't even have to think of it anymore. That when people ask her about her marriage, she goes, what are you talking about? See, that's what it is that people do that. That when the Lord sets his purpose and his life within you, that you don't remember what was going on. You don't remember who you are. There's many times I ran into some friends and sometimes they brought up things from high school. And I say, well, honestly, I don't remember that. How can you not remember that, Megan, they say? That's not who I am anymore. You know? And then last part. In verse 11, it says, Thus the great conductor of music will draw life into the full volume of the harmony of the ages, the royal song of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then it says, You are directly connected to Christ, who like a choir conductor draws out the music, and everyone like a tapestry of art that intertwines in harmony to reveal the full stature of divine inspiration, which is Christ in you. Yeah. Again, the word epicoregio is used. The choir conductor. This time, God is doing the conducting and is leading us into his harmony and giving us access into the road. Yet in this context, I prefer that we are led into a song, an ode, a ceremonious lyric poem. And this form is usually marked by exalted feeling and style. And the term ode derives from a Greek word alluding to a choric song, usually accompanied by a dance. Also a poem to be sung and composed for royal occasions. You see, that's where as the music conductor, he causes us to embrace our identity as a king and a priest and just like David who embraced both roles even though his wife despised him he would dance before the Lord as a priest and at the same time sit on the throne as a king and see that's when the life is put in you and it says that he's the music conductor he's conducting every step as it says in Jeremiah 29 11 that your steps are ordered of the Lord and just as that music is there that if someone plays a wrong note it doesn't sound right but you see that when you think that you've hit a wrong note the Lord corrects it and brings it back into order you know when an orchestra is naturally getting together they sound like a terrible mess when they're warming up but when they become harmonious it's there it's not just the Lord just restoring you individually but as you reflect you see when his light hits you all light can do is reflect and embrace the light and make it more there so as he's getting you harmoniously there and you're entering others lives and atmosphere some of that harmony is being splashed over onto them 
And I want us to go to Song of Solomon 5. I'm going to read it from the message translation. And it says, celebrate with me, friends. Raise your glasses to life, to love. I was sound asleep, but in my dreams I was wide awake. Oh, listen, it's the sound of my lover knocking, calling. Let me in, dear companion, dearest friend, my dove, consummate lover. I'm soaked with the dampness of the night, drenched with dew, shivering in the cold. And then she answers, but I'm in my nightgown. Do you expect me to get dressed? I'm bathing in bed. Do you want me to get dirty? But my lover wouldn't take no for an answer, and the longer he knocked, the more excited I became. I got up to open the door to my lover, sweetly ready to receive him, desiring and expecting. And as I turned the door handle, and when I opened the door, he was gone. My loved one had tired of waiting and left, and I died inside. Oh, I felt so bad. You see, already this is talking of the soul and the spirit together here. And you see, you realize that when you're not with Jesus and you're not embracing his identity, that you die on the inside. You see, without God, there is only death. He says, I ran out looking for him, but he was nowhere to be found. I called in the darkness, but no answer. The night watchmen found me as they patrolled the streets of the city. They slapped and beat and bruised me, ripping off my clothes. These watchmen, who were supposed to be guarding the city. I beg you, sisters in Jerusalem, if you find my lover, please tell him I want him, that I'm heart sick with love for him. And then they say, what's so great about your lover, fair lady? What's so special about him that you beg for our help? And then she answers, my dear lover glows with help, red-blooded, radiant. He's one in a million. There's no one quite lo like him. And you see, that's what it is. It's when we're there and we're seeking. He's there to be found. And as it, you go on and read on in chapter 6, she finds him along the garden. He's a bone alive. And he's smelling the flowers and waiting for her to be there. But you see... Even when there's times that we allow circumstance to rule and we forget to say no to it and we forget that some, sometimes it comes like an overwhelming storm over us. But you have to let the glory overwhelm. And even if you were like the woman here that didn't want to get up because you didn't want to change, that when you finally do get up, even if someone accuses you of falseness, accuses you of darkness, that remember that his love and his life goes over there where it says that my dear lover glows with health, red-blooded, radiant. You see, that's, that's why she longed for him, because there was life there. That's why the woman at the well, even though that Jesus wasn't supposed to talk to Samaritans and Jews, they didn't talk in that day. And he asked her for water and then revealed to her that he was the living water, that he gave everlasting life where she would never thirst again. That's where she realized that she was probably just like this woman, this representation. Just like us, that a lot of times when we come back to Christ, when someone finally walks in here and says, okay, I surrender, they expect you to slap you and to bruise you and to strip you naked, but instead there's a love and a glory because we do like Michelle Donald said, that we don't see the darkness, but we see the inner man. We see it upon the heart just as God did because we have that Christ identity. I was reading a little bit of the... Blessing, God, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich, and I have no sorrow by Kenneth Copeland. And he was talking in there that if we have the blessing of the life, that we have no fear. And he went on to talk about fear is faith in death. And you see, he was talking about that when someone has a fear of a dangerous animal, that they believe in its power and authority over them. When someone has fear of disease, that they're going to get sick, that they're already believing 
and of death of the power and authority. When they have fear of death itself, they're believing that it has power and authority over you. But it says in the word that he's conquered all death. That he's overcome that. And if we're in him and we are him, then we've conquered all these yeah. things. And there's no reason to fear. You know, I heard someone share about that they had two daughters that had children. And one had a terrible time and she was screaming because she had fear. And the other one just saw the joy of the Lord and she already thanked the Lord when she had the baby that it was going to be all right. You know what? She It came out quicker than what they thought. And that she, because she had joy and she believed in the healing and that the life coming forth. And you see, that's what's within us. That if we allow fear and a belief in circumstance there, that it will come out. Because you have that power in the tongue. There's life and death in the power of your tongue. That if you're you're worried about it, you're doubting and all this stuff, that it's going to take the longer road if you don't change your confession and your belief. But when you have a belief in the life and the joy of God and everything that is there in the blessing of you that has promised you peace there, that's where we get on that harmonious track in the music. It just flows. And he sets forth the path quickly. That is why as we walked in and we believed and we decided to go up higher, no matter what someone says to us, no matter what someone says, well, you're just the crazy church, that your pastor is demon possessed and all this stuff like that. But we know what the life of God is that we have walked quickly. You know, there were times, so many times in my life, I'll pick on my own self, that the last year I was at the last school before this one, that year, I had fear because I already knew my name was put on a secret list that they were all going to let me go. And you know, at first, it was like pure hell going through that, I'm going to be honest, because every evaluation I would get, they would do that. They would chew me out. They would scream at me. They'd yell at me, this is my administration, my boss, about everything. But you know what? I realized, you know what? I might have been treated like this, but that's not who I am that I'm royalty, that I was seeing the wrong picture, that I was having fear of losing my job, and I did lose my job. But you know what? I decided, you know what? This isn't who I am. They're speaking falsely about me. Everything they have, I even had to go before the district and plead my case that I was a safe and valuable teacher, and they were trying to say I wasn't. But you know what? When I started speaking that forth, I actually got a letter of recommendation from the boss that said I did all these things that he recanted, everything that he said. And then I got hired. And now I know where I am. You see, I thought maybe there couldn't be a school better than that one. But at this one, there was a family. And you see, now I've gotten better evaluations than I have in all the six years that I've been teaching. Because you see, I allowed life to take place. And I allowed, when a spoken word came from Brother Frank, he said, Megan, you're going to have fat bread and royal dainties. And you know, I accepted that. I accepted that in my spirit, that I was no longer unworthiness. So now, when administrators come in, I don't have any fear about it. I don't have any fear, because I used to get so nervous. I, my stomach would get knots. Oh, Lord, they're going to be watching me. They're going to be critiquing me. But instead, I said, you know what? Just let them see the joy of the Lord. And we have a new assistant principal this year. And the first thing she said to me is that I just love coming in your room. It's so peaceful and so joyful in there. I could sit in your room for hours. <coughs> and you know what? That's because of the life of God that's there. And you have to allow it just to flow. Some of us, we want to have our hand in it. But the Lord, it says in the Word, the battle is the Lord's. And you've got to take your hand off. Because when we stop meddling in there and with this mind, letting it control the circumstance, and you allow the Lord to take over, that's where those steps come into place. That's where it sounds like a masterpiece being played there. You know, I think of when I first was really thinking of the spirit of life and the life of God and really testing the waters to see it. There was one day uh, before they changed the ordinance, 
we used to walk our dog through the Wildwood Cemetery. And, you know, some people in there, you know, walking through the dead place? Well, I didn't see any death there, you know, I was just, it was a path for us just to walk on it. It was quiet and, and nobody really went in there. And, you know what, I, I just would sing worship song and praise the Lord as I would walk with the dog through there. And I would usually just look at the trees. And it was, I decided one time because there was, I think there was a mower, and I decided to take a different way than my usual path. And when I took a different way, the Lord showed me this big old oak tree that was at one of the entrances. And in that big old oak tree, he showed me that it's almost like a double-mindedness, but that you can have life in it. And this tree was growing right at the edge of a fence. And that even though that tree was there, all surrounded by death, that life had gone in that tree. It was the biggest oak out of the whole entire cemetery, right at the entrance. And a fence was there. And that tree had overtaken that fence. That fence was growing through the middle of that tree. And the Lord showed me that you could be walking in the midst of death and life. If you allow yourself to be a tree, the evergreen tree that always has life, planted by the words as in Revelation, that you will overtake the death every time. Every time you allow life to flood the atmosphere, you will allow it to overtake. It does. It overcomes. It's just like when the woman is having a baby, she might on the physical look like all death. Her hair's all messed up. She might be pale as all can be. And she might look like she's in terrible pain. But as soon as that life overcomes and comes out, she forgets about all the pain and only sees the joy of that life that that baby has come forth and holds her in her arms. And the Lord is saying, Hold life in your arms like a precious baby because that's how he holds you. You are a precious treasure, but you're a grown man child in his sight. Not one on the milk of the word, but one on the meat. That's what he's feeding us is the meat of the word. And I encourage you sometime to read out of Ezekiel 37. Because all there when he was prophesying and he saw that valley of dry bones there. Because it, it says in here, I like how it says in the message, it says they were bleached by the sun. That means that they were as dried out as they could possibly be. And the Lord told him to prophesy. And it says, kind of around verse 5, it says, he said, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. Tell the breath, because every time breath is there, it means spirit. So breath, spirit, and life. That's where our life comes from. We breathe. And it says, God, the Master says, come from the four winds. Come breathe on the slain bodies. Breathe life. And so I prophesied, just as he commanded me. And the breath entered them, and they came alive. And they stood up on their feet, a huge army. And then God said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, which is representing us as a church. And listen to what they're saying. Our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. There's nothing left of us. Therefore prophesy, tell them. God the Master says, I'll dig up your graves and bring you out alive, O my people. And then I'll take you straight to the land of Israel. And when I dig up graves and bring you out as my people, you'll realize that I am God. I'll breathe my life into you and you'll live. And then I'll lead you straight back to your land and you'll realize that I am God. I've said it and I'll do it. And that's God's decree. And that's God's decree over us is that there's life within us. And the last scripture I want to go to is 2 Peter 2. And it says, Welcome to the living stone, the source of life. 
The workman took one and looked and threw it out. And God set it in a place of honor. Present yourselves as building stones for the construction of a sanctuary, vibrant with life, in which you'll serve as holy priests, offering Christ-approved lives up to God. And you see, that's what it is. For this life of God, that He overtakes us, and He floods us with His atmosphere, and He causes heaven to walk into our earth, and causes them to kiss one another. And you see, when He loves on you, when He sends you in His loving room of His soul and His spirit, and gives him you his mind and makes you his reflection that every time you look in the mirror you see yourself as Christ. That's not nothing bold to say. It's just revealing your identity. It's just saying who you are. When someone asks you who you are, I don't have to say Megan and Tina or Aunt Barbara. Say I'm Christ. And you don't even have to speak. It's in your very word. People know that it's within you, especially if they got the life of God on the inside of them, that your life speaks to their life, that he calls after deep. That identity just reflects, because light reflects light. And when light keeps going, it keeps flooding, it keeps big and getting bigger. You know, I read some good news the other day in a magazine. They had for many years, they were very worried about the country of China. You know, that's where Ruth Ford Heflin started out. And they said for the longest time that Christianity was the least of religions there in the whole country of China. But they, every time they did a census and a report, and they just did a recent census in China, and they actually discovered, even though there's a lot of underground churches there, that Christianity is actually the top religion out of the entire country. And you see, it's because light flooded into life. There were people like Ruth Ford Heflin that planted seeds in there and interceded, and they spoke forth the light and the kingdom of God. Those people began to embrace it. And I just see as that, that because they are, the top one, that it's no longer going to be underground for them, that they can be on a public display. I was talking to uh, one of my former roommates, Mio, and she lives in Tokyo, Japan. And you see there, they were kind of like China. They are only 1% Christian. And she said that one concern <coughs> that she has is that there's been some missionaries from other countries that are trying to make all of the churches, she says it's like going to a dating website when you get there, but they're trying to click all the young people with the young people and try to make it a click church. And she said, hey, and I've had the hardest time. I've been trying to go from church to church and to find a church that's about the kingdom and the life of God and not about clicks. But you see, that's what we can speak that into the atmosphere. Because once you shared that with me, I said, well, Mia, that can change. Send the blink of an eye. Just like that. I said, it's not hopeless. She said a lot of times it feels like it's hopeless because she wants to tell her friends and her co-workers about Jesus, but she doesn't have the liberty to do it. But you know what? Just like China, if he can change China, he can change Japan. They're just their sister countries right there together. But you see, that's what it is, is that it goes beyond just us. Some people are so self-centered, but that's not what the Lord is. He makes us a unity in a body. And just like the army in Ezekiel 37, when he brings us together, he takes out the dryness out of us, and he puts us anew, and the muscles, and then the flesh, and he breathes the life of God. They became an army. And you see, as an army of God, we are greater. We're greater. You can feel hopeless if you're the only one doing it. But you see, you're never alone. Because if you're in Christ, He's always with you. That you yourself can feel as an army. But it makes it even better when we come in unity. And as I end here, it was revealed. And I felt it, felt it too. And Pastor said that it felt like someone was just going by 
how it started out, how the worship leader was. But see, you have to, when you enter this physical building and you join up with the church, the body of Christ, that you can't be moved by what the atmosphere looks like. You see, they used to say all the time, watch out for the silent ones. There's more in them than you know. Because when you decide that there's already going to be glory, because see, you are the glory of the Lord. And you already decide that there is going to be movement every service. Why not let it increase? Don't be moved by what you see when you first enter that door. But just let the Spirit overtake you, even if you have a party by yourself every time you come in. Because usually when it starts with one, it just goes because light reflects light. There. 